Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Spotlight Series webinar, All for One and One for All, How Patient Safety Starts with Healthcare Workers. My name is Jennifer Zelmer. I'm the CEO of Healthcare Excellence Canada and delighted to be joining you today from traditional, unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin territory in a place that we now call Ottawa, where I'm so lovely, so lucky to be able to live, work and play, even on days when it's quite cold like today. Um, and one of the things that I've been learning about the place where I now live is that the watersheds in this area have always been a traditional gathering place, a place where people came together to exchange, to learn, to share with each other. And so hopefully in this new virtual way, we can continue some of those traditions, but a coast to coast to coast across uh, the land that has been walked by Indigenous people since the beginning. And I invite you to pop into the chat, introduce yourself to those who are on the line, and take a minute to reflect on uh, the territories that you're joining us from today. And with that, just before we dive into uh, today's webinar, uh, the formal content, I do have a few uh, housekeeping announcements. A reminder that today's, record, today's webinar is recorded um, for the benefit of those who aren't able to join us right at this moment. And welcome to those who are watching on the recording. Si vous voulez entendre aujourd'hui en français, uh, veuillez appuyer sur le bouton French dans le menu d'interprétation qui est au bas de l'écran. If you need tech support today, feel free to type into the chat and uh, we'll be able to help you out. If you're interested in, in seeing the English live transcription um, and subtitles, you can do that by clicking the CC live transcription button. We haven't quite sorted that out yet live for French, so apologies, but the French captions will be available on the session recordings for those who are watching there. So now, with that out of the way, uh, let me uh, welcome you again to today's webinar, All for One, One for All, How Patient Safety Starts with Healthcare Workers. And so delighted to have this opportunity for a conversation today as part of the Spotlight series that brings all of us together to talk about things that are important to shaping the future of safety and quality in healthcare today and tomorrow. And I'm joined today by a fantastic group of folks to talk about the conditions of work and the conditions of care and you know, the ways that uh, focus on safety of healthcare providers affects patient safety um, and really how, how do we practice what we preach in terms of moving forward um, with supporting psychological and physical health and safety in the workplace. We recognize that some of the topics that we're addressing today may be difficult for some people, and uh, it's absolutely okay not to be okay, particularly in the complicated times that we're in right now. We'll be popping into the chat in just a minute a series of mental health resources uh, should you need to have them handy in case either you or someone you know is in need. It's always helpful to have them directly at hand. Um, and we also have a uh, registered counselor, Kathleen Gorman, who's uh, available today. She's uh, online during the time of our webinar and for two hours subsequently, there's no charge to connect with her and her contact information will be posted shortly in the chat as well, if you should have a need. So with that, I believe uh, those are my housekeeping items for today. And uh, I'd like to invite into our conversation all of our panelists. So if I can invite you to turn on your cameras, uh, we'll be able to see everyone and get started. Um, and so let me introduce our four panelists today and give them a chance to say hello to you. Um, and I invite you again, if you are joined, just joining us now, we're here at the beginning, feel free to introduce everyone who's on the webinar today yourself in the chat. And to add at any point, we want to make this interactive for everyone. So at any point during the webinar, pop questions or resources to share with others or comments into the chat as well. So right at the top of my screen, Alice, you're first up. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Alice Watt, who's a senior medication safety specialist with our partners at the Institute for Safe Medication Practices Canada and an amazing hospital pharmacist as well. Alice, say hello. Hello everyone, it's great to be here. I'm so grateful to live, play, ski and work in Markham, Ontario, in the land of the Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, Anishinaabeg, 
Seneca, Chippewa, and the current treaty holders of the Mississaugas of the Credit Peoples. I've worked both as a community pharmacist and currently work as a hospital pharmacist in both urban and rural settings. I also work at ISMP Canada as a medication safety specialist on the incident analysis team, long care and virtual care initiatives. I'm really honored to be here today to be a part of this panel and on this important subject. I am grateful to you all for coming out of your very busy day and I invite you to share your thoughts with us. Thanks so much, Alice. I appreciate that. Uh, next around our virtual circle today, um, although it's squares because it's Zoom, but anyway, um, is Wendy Nicklin. And I've known Wendy for more years than we might care to admit to. Uh, Wendy is uh, among the many hats that she wears, a patient partner with Patients for Patient Safety Canada, and delighted to have you joining our conversation today. Wendy, did you want to say hello? Yeah, thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, it's an absolute honor to be here and to have been invited to participate. And I'm here wearing my hat, as uh, Jen mentioned, of Patients for Patient Safety Canada and to bring that patient perspective to what is going on. As a very brief background, uh, the harm in my own family is related to my sister-in-law who had open heart surgery 10 years ago and woke up paraplegic. And it's... Um, it's a very tragic story and it, it's led me in the journey with her uh, to be with Patients for Patient Safety Canada and see how I might contribute from the patient family perspective to uh, safer healthcare. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today, Wendy, and for bringing particularly the hat that you're wearing today to this important conversation. So important that the right people are around the table. So thank, thank you, you. Thank you for that. Uh, next around our virtual circle today is Michael Gardham, who uh, also has many hats, including one that he is currently wearing as CEO of Health PEI. Michael, delighted to have you join us today and I'd invite you to say hello. Yeah, thanks very much, Jennifer. Hi, everybody. Um, happy to be here uh, as the CEO of Health PEI. And those of you who have heard me speak before know that I have a, a long history in the world of uh, patient safety, especially as it relates to the spread of healthcare associated infections. Uh, very much looking forward to having this conversation today. Thanks. Thanks so much, Michael. And last but definitely not least, that's the advantage of a circle is we're all equal around it. Uh, so delighted to introduce Danielle Bellamy, who uh, also wears many hats, but today is coming with a hat as Director of Continuing Care with Saskatchewan Health Authority. So um, broadening our geographical reach as well as reach of perspectives. Danielle, over to you. So hello everyone, glad to be here today. I'm coming at you from Treaty 4 territory. Um, a little bit about me, I started my career working the floor as a bench tech, as a medical lab technologist, and um, kind of worked through the system. And now I'm a leader in the system as a director in long term care. Um, just as a fair warning, I've got a kid home self isolating. So you may see her in the background, I've given her lots of snacks and electronics, but she's four. So that's <laughs> its own challenge. So if you see a little person come in, uh, I think that's just the world that we're living in right now. But thanks for everyone coming today. And I'm glad to be here. It absolutely is. And uh, if she does join us, hopefully she'll be comfortable waving hello and uh, we'll all appreciate her participation as well. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is our panel for today. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. We thought we might start out by just sharing everyone's perspective on an issue that, um, you know, the pandemic seems to be defining our lives, uh, but has been, this issue has been important for pre-pandemic, will continue to be important for years to come. And that's that relationship between staff safety and patient safety and the um, you know, highlighted by World Patient Safety Day, um, not last year, but the year before in terms of that relationship, and really looking at um, what do we know, how do we see from our various fields of view, um, different perspectives on this issue. So, I mean, Alice, you're working on the front lines as a direct care provider. How do you see that relationship? Oh, thanks. Um, for me, I think staff safety means many things, um, physical psychological, social, emotional, moral, and cultural safety. 
When I think of staff protecting patients from errors, I picture a hockey goalie stopping the pucks from getting into the net. And like any great hockey team, the goalie depends on a good defense to help stop the puck. And through this pandemic, the pucks have been flying at us. And we're just all trying to do the best that we can, working together to stop them from getting through. And we need to protect the goalie to protect the patients. So what does that look like for me? Um, at the beginning of a, this pandemic, a student had reported to us they were exposed to a patient who later turned out to be COVID positive. I could see that there was risk for them and many healthcare providers. And learning from SARS, we had done medication histories by telephone, and that's what we decided to do. We pivoted to doing telephone medication histories where possible in the ED. We did it to save on the PPE because there's such a shortage at the beginning and to protect us from exposures and inadvertent uh, transmissions to other patients, coworkers, and even our families. Now that's important to me because I, was, um, I am immunocompromised. And uh, we also tapped into the CSHP Hospital Pharmacist COVID-19 network, asking for best practices on virtual medication history and our collective experiences from across the country and learning from ISMP Canada recommendations. And um, that's what we did to keep us safe. Um, since then, we've seen really innovative examples of how hospital pharmacists have been doing discharge education through different ways like drive-through style in the parking lot. Uh, so that they can talk to caregivers who can't come in. Thanks, Alice, and really appreciate bringing some of those tangible examples too. And I'm sure we'll get into more of them as our conversation progresses of where can we find some of those, those sweet spots, the things that we've seen work well, the things that we can build on. Wendy, I wonder if I can turn to you next. And from the perspective of, of patients, of essential care partners, with patients, how do you see this relationship? Well, the relationship is, is totally intertwined. Um, you can't have one without the other. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And I want to acknowledge before I go further that um, I've had the input of many of the patients for patient safety members um, in what I'm gonna say. So these are my words on, be, on behalf of our group. Um, no, they are absolutely intertwined. Um, I think it's very important as well that we have some discussion about culture because safety, people often just want to count what's happening and what's not happening. And to me, that's not what it's about. It's about developing a culture, a culture within which it is safe for staff, it is safe for patients, and in which there's that sort of symbiotic relationship that, that we have a risk at times, I think, of oversimplifying. Um, if we track the infection rates, if we track this or that, is the environment safer, safer? And I think it, it's critical that we have that discussion about culture and what progress we might be able to make in that regard. Thanks so much, Wendy. And I think that might actually also be a perfect segue over to Michael, because Michael, I know you've always had a broad view of safety as well. So do you want to jump in in terms of your perspectives? Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, this this topic is kind of near and dear to my heart as uh, as a physician who's had a variety of roles in Ontario and now here in, in health PEI. I mean, I can I could fill the hour with anecdotes of circumstances where staff weren't safe and therefore patients were harmed. I mean, there's a, a very direct correlation between them. You know, stories like a uh, bullying doctor where nurses don't feel comfortable speaking up, they don't have psychological safety, therefore harm comes to the newborn baby. Ha happens every day in our healthcare system. So there's a, a real direct link there. And it's one of the reasons why when I took over as CEO here, um, when we redid our strategic plan, we put healthy teams as our first strategic priority. And that had never been done before, where we always focused on patients, patients, patients. And my point to exactly this conversation was, you can talk about patient safety all you want, but if your staff don't have psychological safety, if they don't feel supported, if they're not seen, heard, respected in the workplace, you're wasting your time. And um, I'm not gonna support new patient safety initiatives until we focus on staff safety initiatives. We have to do both. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, you, you really, 
my whole career, I've seen people launching new patient safety initiatives in the to a into a culture where there is no psychological safety with the staff and they fail and they fail over and over again. And so I think this is really getting at kind of the crux of, of patient safety is the whole, the whole community needs to feel safe. It's not just the patients, it's the patients and everybody else. And it really is that community in it, isn't it? Because we all come together, whether it's you know virtual, as you were using the example, Alice, or physically, it is that connection point. Danielle, I know you see those connection points in your work too. Did you want to weigh in at this point too? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, as a leader myself, yes, my direct care team is a big part of staff safety, but I also have to really acknowledge my manager team and the psychological safety that's needed for them to be leading through this pandemic. They've had to be the absolute rock for my front line. Um, there's been, and I know as we know, the changes continue to happen, but at the beginning of that pandemic, it was constant changes. Like sometimes morning was different than the afternoon kind of thing. So um, for me, it's been, how do I support my team, how do I make sure that they're getting um, very clear communication so that they can feel very confident in what the direction changes to then bring to their team? Because when their frontline team is like, okay, I know what I need to be doing. I understand the changes, why they're happening. Um, sometimes that was harder to, to maybe get across, but why the changes are happening and what they need to be doing, then they can focus on their patients and they're not confused about direction. So that's been a huge part of of my role in this pandemic is how do I make sure that our communication is really clear and that our managers can come back and say, you know what, this wasn't clear. We need more information on this and feel supported to flag that things aren't clear and that we can help them through that. So for me, that's a big part is making sure that my manager team feels supported so they can support their direct care team who can then support their patients. Such an important point, Danielle, in terms of like taking that big view right? And, you know, who, who all needs to be part of that circle of safety um, in terms of being able to move us forward. And also the fact that, you know, all of you have spoken about how things are evolving, um, how what we used to do maybe isn't the same way as we think about it now, how we need to think differently. I'll just add another nuance to that. You know, it's only in the last few years, really, and particularly during the pandemic that we've thought about the online safety of healthcare providers, for instance, and, and how that pl might play out too. So I wonder if I can give you each a chance to talk a little bit about the evolution and maybe um, Michael, I'll start with you because you talked about the fact that your new strategic plan put uh, the safety of the team up front. Can you talk about how you've seen things changing over time and maybe give us a, a little foreshadowing in terms of where you think they need to go? Yeah, I wish I could tell you we fixed all of our problems here at Health BDI, but uh, we haven't yet. I mean, our um, this is very much in its infancy. This is something we just uh, we just started focusing on uh, when I when I came in as CEO, which wasn't that long ago. So it's um, you know where we're seeing some some sort of tangible early first steps is, you know, the, the amount of emails that we get back from people saying, thank you so much for hearing me, the fact that you followed up with me, the fact that I felt somebody listened to me and, you know, I was concerned about this. You know, really what we're trying to do is set the, we're trying to set the tone from uh, the top of the organization. I once had somebody tell me that the, the CEO doesn't have much control over culture, which I think is garbage. Uh, the CEO is all the control over culture. And, and it's very important that our leadership team to make it really clear that we are going to respect diverse opinions. We're going to respect people who disagree with us. We want to hear from everybody else. Um, and there's lots of, again, lots of safety literature on that kind of approach, right? High reliability organizations, they flatten the hierarchy, they do all these things. And so we're in the process of doing that now with our leadership team. And I can say at the leadership level, the conversations have changed uh, really dramatically. Uh, there, is, there is no deference to authority. There's deference to expertise, which is important, but there isn't necessarily deference to authority. Everybody has an opinion. Uh, people feel comfortable speaking up, saying, I'm, I'm worried about this. I'm not sure this is going to work. 
Um, you know, we launched a, a staff wellness line in the, in the last four weeks in the middle of the pandemic. We've arranged for them to get proper COVID testing quicker. We've done a, a hundred things. And what really strikes me, and it makes me kind of sad, to be honest with you, is the amount of feedback I get from people saying we, we've never been treated like this before. And, and from my perspective, that's that's the way we should always be, be treating people. So it'll be an interesting journey for us. I mean, we're very early on, but it's, um, you know, this is very much a key focus. And I think our biggest challenge will be the public, and I would say the political world, they're not really all that excited about staff safety. They talk about it, but what they really want to talk about is the new program and the new widget and the new thing and, and that sort of thing. And so our biggest challenge will be to maintain our focus on this, despite all of the external distractions that are trying to get us to drop it, to do something else. I won't drop it um, because this is, this, this is foundational. I don't want to be talking about what color to paint on the walls when our foundation is not secure. So that's kind of where we are, you know, check back with me in a couple of years and I'll tell you whether I uh, flamed out or not, but that's, that's where we're hoping to go. I knew it was going to happen there. I was going to catch myself on mute. Apologies for that. Thanks so much for sharing, Michael, that journey, right? Because we're all on a journey and we may start in different places, but, you know, we've got a path to travel for sure. And just wanted to point out, there's been some great resources posted in the chat as well, um, including a Wana mentioned OECD report that came out today that did suggest that health workers in Canada were more likely than those in some other countries to say that they felt that they could talk to a manager, that they were supported in that way. I will say that report is not all rosy. Um, many people also said that they didn't feel that there were other types of supports that were needed for safety. So, you know, every single country in that report has things to, um, things to learn and things to share. I think is is one of the lessons from from that release this morning. Um, speaking of which, maybe Wendy, I'll slide over to you because you've seen an evolution on a variety of fronts. I wonder if you can talk about some of the changes you've seen and maybe reflect on some of Michael's perspectives on what are the foundations that we need. Yeah, thank you very much. The progress, I use that word lightly, the evolution um, has been quite a story. And um, going back to the IOM report way back in 1998, 99, and then we had our own Baker Norton study, we've come, we've come a long way in our understanding of safety. Um, we've come a long way in what are some steps to take. And there's been some amazing research um, showing what works, what doesn't work, where we can improve. But again, I'll go to the culture piece. And as Michael mentioned, um, that culture is fundamental. And I have many, I've spoken to many leaders who can uh, say their commitment to culture, um, but whether it's in fact there and whether or not it is coming from the top. And again, I agree 100% with what Michael said, it comes from the board and the CEO and that commitment to a safe culture, the commitment to having a transparent environment, a just culture, um, a culture in which there truly is a focus on improving the care. And I think now we're learning when you look at some of the newer research, in particular, I think Navrene Amberberti, is that issue of we have to learn how to manage risk besides deal with what are we doing to make it safer? Because risk is always going to be with us. And I would suggest to everyone that the risk we are facing right now in healthcare is beyond description. Um, the immense HHR staffing shortage is incredible on top of the pandemic, on top of the stress, um, on top of the, um, the high occupancy rates, etc. And I think we have the perfect storm. And I think, I just hope as we move through this and progress on the journey, uh, that the lessons learned from this period we are going through, which is gonna continue for at least another few years, that we truly don't lose the opportunity to say, the Band-Aid's been stripped off the gaps and the gaps that you and I and everyone knew full well were there 
are now in spades in front of us. And um, I worry that our healthcare environment right now is far more unsafe than it's been before. And, uh, but we've got a great opportunity then. What are the learnings? What's working? What's not working? What is fluff? What's essential? And focus on, on that culture, but how we then learn from what's going on. But um, I think the risks as healthcare workers and as patients, the risks being faced now are um, unfortunately um, astronomical. Yeah, thanks for sharing that perspective, Wendy, and and thinking about that evolution over time. And you, like Michael, referenced culture. And Danielle, you didn't use that word in your earlier remarks, but it was there in everything that you were saying. So I wonder if you'd like to weigh in on sort of how you see that evolution and what you see as the foundations. So I think something that we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic, I think about how we actually walked the walk of what we were talking. So I think um, prior to pandemic, we talked lots about, um, you know what, if you're sick, stay home. We talked about how important hand hygiene was and it was all kind of, not to say we didn't do it, but I don't think teams felt supported in it. I don't think, I know personally from when I worked on the front line, I didn't feel like if I was sick that staying home was the best thing for me to do because I felt like I was letting my team down, I was letting people down, all of a sudden we were working short. So what I've seen in our health authority is that is, it's almost, it's a directive now. If you are sick, you are not to come to work. So team members are now feeling supported to say, okay, I don't have to make that decision of, am I letting my team down by staying home and not spreading whatever I have, right? So we're finally, I think, um, we're, we're giving them that. We're giving them that opportunity to say, you know what, this is not safe for me to go to work and and spread whatever I have, even with all the PPE that we have right now. So um, I like that. I like that we've got more resources put in, even though we have very limited resources, but resources put into um, safety and outbreak management. In our area, we have things called safety walks and we go into outbreak situations. So knowing that we have so many different rules that need to be followed in an outbreak, knowing that we're human, we're not gonna be 100% all the time. We have now other resources coming in from our infection control areas to say, hey, here's a couple things that need to be improved because we know that we can't be 100% all the time. So it's great to see those resources coming in, supporting with another set of eyes to say, here's some things you could do better. Let's get through this outbreak together and let's meet every day and, and have those discussions. So I think that's really great to see and that we are actually seeing resources put in so that people feel like they can work safe and um, not be coming to work exactly when they're sick, which is what you kind of felt that pressure to do before. So I really like seeing that evolution in how we um, support our healthcare workers in doing that. Yeah, I really appreciate that perspective, Danielle, because you're totally right, right? One thing can be written down, but then it's, you know, work as done versus work as imagined or, you know, coming into work as done versus coming into work as imagined and, and all of those changes. And I think you've kind of brought us back full circle also to uh, Alice's goalie, analogy um, in terms of the multiple safeguards along the way and your hockey analogy may be a better one than the Swiss cheese one for Canada but sometimes used as well so Alice I wonder if you want to weigh in what are your perspectives on sort of the changes that you're seeing the evolution yeah thanks so much um, I think Maya Angelou said do the best you can until you know better and then when you know better do better and that's how we've been working throughout the pandemic and as new information about the virus and its transmission unfolds, we change what we do to protect ourselves and our patients. And like Danielle said, it's like sometimes something that you do in the morning is different than what we're supposed to do in the evening. And we've had to move quickly to adapt and change the rules to protect ourselves from this very transmissible virus. And um, I really liked what Wendy and Michael said about um, it being a journey like it's not a project to reduce errors by 10 percent, and then we pat ourselves on the back when we reach, reach that, that, that that's not right it shouldn't be a project with a start and an end and i agree it's a journey of always getting better always sharing and learning and making constant tweaks to make it safer for healthcare workers and patients 
and making it safe for them to be able to speak up and, and stop the line if they see something that is not safe. And um, that has to do a lot with the culture and not a culture of blame and shame, but one that is thanking healthcare workers when they speak up for pointing out these uh, weaknesses that, where we can make it better. I think um, the recent bulletin that ISMP wrote about an organization that discovered outdated vaccines had been given in their clinic, they immediately sent out an alert about it to all other clinics in the area to check their supply. And as a result, they were able to prevent the same thing from happening in three other clinics and detect the error in three other clinics and therefore take action to notify and treat those who are affected. And these are the good news kinds of stories about organizations that share even beyond their walls about errors and learnings about things that they've done to improve. And we need to do more of that during this pandemic. And that gives me hope if we can see more examples of people sharing their errors and what they learn from it. Thanks so much for that example, Alice. And I think you know gives a really good example of the psychological safety that's needed, not just within organizations, but within communities and more broadly as well. And uh, wanted to give a shout out to uh, those in the chat who've continued to share resources and opportunities, including the review of long-term care standards that's just been launched. And to invite, I could hog all the airtime. I could talk to these guys for like the next century, probably very happily. I notice, Alice, you've got tea or coffee there, so you might be okay to continue that. Others might not. But I would like to make sure that others, if you've got questions or comments, please feel free to type them into the chat and we'll try and make sure to include them as part of our broader conversation. And uh, Alice is actually just done the, the turn to where I thought we might go next, which is, you know, what are you seeing as those examples, those points of light, those things where you're seeing it's, it's been really effective in improving staff safety in ways that have had an impact on patient safety. And, you know, Alice just gave us a great example of that. I'm wondering if, if others want to weigh in and maybe Wendy, we should start with you from a patient perspective. What have you seen um, that's been you know, a point of light that you think might be useful for others to learn from. Oh, you're on mute, Wendy. Mute. Yeah, thank you. Um, a point of light. Um, I think there's glimmers. Um, however, I frankly have difficulty from a patient's perspective of seeing what that point of light is. Um, you know, we've now, from the healthcare standpoint, many organizations have crisis standards of care. That's pretty scary, um, but you know, appreciate that we need to be organized in that regard when those tough decisions are made. We've got the massive shift to virtual care. And um, I think for certain very specific instances, it's appropriate. Um, I worry big time about what is being missed due to virtual assessment. A uh, personal example from a few days ago, a colleague who's been ill since September, every visit's been virtual. Yeah, he's 50 years old. He had a CT scan on Sunday. He's got malignancies in his kidney, and metastasized to his lung and also to bone. And he was being treated with antibiotics. Um, he never actually had an in-person assessment. And maybe it would not have made any difference, but I think you know, virtual care we all love, you save the gas, you don't have to be there in person, it saves time, we can do it quickly. But what is what is said is 10% of the message, right? The rest of the message is in the assessment, is in the body language, is in all the other pieces that are so important from that one-on-one -on -one dialogue and interaction. So I think we've got to really look carefully at, we've swung the pendulum a certain way and how do we learn but, uh, but bring it back um, a, certain, a certain way? And the last thing I'll mention is that I think staff will need to be careful as to what's delegated to families. I think there is a tendency, I think many of patients, whether in ambulatory care or in the hospital, have a family member with them. I think everyone's hypervigilant and you know, wants to be there to support. But families are not equipped for the type of assessment or whatever that still needs to be done. And I've heard people say when they have a relative with them, their nurse or physician almost don't come by. They know they're okay. They've got someone with them. If there's a problem, they'll come and get us. 
and there can be two or three hours before someone has checked in. So I think there's a, there are some th a lot of things we've learned, but I think we really need to look carefully at those and how do we learn from what those are, uh, accept where the strengths are, but at the same time, uh, recognize where we have introduced risks by default, not intentionally, but I think by default, we've introduced some new risks. So we'll have to really watch carefully as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for those reflections, Wendy, and, and that understanding of the balance between risks and opportunities and, and where do we really thoughtfully look at um, some of the changes that have happened and where are the parts of that that we absolutely want to double down on because they've worked really well and where are the parts that we need to say you know what that may have been either how we had to do it at the time or what seemed like the right idea at the time but we need to take a different path i wonder if i can turn to you michael and some of your reflections particularly because you've been in multiple jurisdictions you you've had lots of fields of view that are different where are you seeing some of those sort of points of light or opportunities that we might learn from going forward, recognizing the kinds of risks that Wendy talked about as well? Yeah, thanks. I, I would agree with Wendy. It's a particularly dark time right now. I think we're all kind of fried after two years of pandemic, to be honest with you. And um, we're about to be uh, about to have our friends from uh, uh, accreditation come visit us in June and everybody's just like, oh my God, I can't imagine that we're going to be doing that now um, with on top of everything else. So people are, are tired and they're, they're frazzled. You know, areas though where in other jobs, I, I've definitely seen many points of, of, of light and, and it all comes down to, in my mind, the empowerment of the frontline workers to not only have a voice, but to actually kind of not only get on the bus, but actually drive the bus. And so where, you know, the role of leadership or the sponsor was to say, we need to get to here, but we empower you to figure out how we're going to get there. Um, you know, some of the work we did with a, a series of hospitals in upstate New York, where they had dramatic reductions in falls and they had reductions in pressure injury and a lot of really good stuff for essentially no money. It was all kind of cultural. It was all them being heard and, and starting to lead a new way of doing things. You know, when I worked with uh, Hand Hygiene New Zealand and they brought about an entirely new hand washing program for the country, um, after having not been able to get there for several years and the, the bright sparks were again, people realizing that they had the knowledge within themselves to figure out how to make this better, but they had never really been engaged in that conversation. They had always kind of been told what to do. Um, and so it's when I said earlier on, it's kind of a dark time because, of course, we've all shifted right back into everybody telling everybody what to do all the time. I mean, I joked the other day looking at the COVID guidance on Ontario's website. I think it's over a thousand pages now of telling people how to how to manage this. Um, you know, we're a long way away from going to people and saying, well, you know, how do you think we should do this? And here are the min specs and how do you, how do you think we can figure out the right way forward? But to me, I think that it's that when you start to see frontline staff empowered to have a voice and start to lead change initiatives themselves, rather than beating them with a stick to get them to do it, which is how many organizations work. Um, when you start to see that, that is very inspiring. And that is the way out of what we're dealing with. Um, but it's very hard for organizations to, to wrap their head around it. It's so much easier to say, we're just going to uh, enforce this new protocol or, or do whatever. And we're going to make your education mandatory to make sure you all do it. But we're not getting at the crux of the issue, which is people need to feel ownership for this. And so where I've seen that work, it's been really, it's been really remarkable. And um, that's what I'm trying to achieve here. Uh, and as I said, we'll see where we get to. And maybe I can just bring in a comment from the chat and, and build Michael on, on what you just said. One of uh, Patricia raised the, you know, how do we maintain those kind of broader quality initiatives in the face of the urgency 
that is COVID and in, in the face of the difficult times that we're going through, how do we make sure that that doesn't get pushed aside, that we don't just become a top-down directives kind of culture? You know, I, I, think, that's, I think that's really hard. I think for me, one of the, the key strategies has been prioritizing what do we need to keep doing and what can we stop doing? Uh, it's hard to say, to your frontline staff who are, you know, under-resourced and doing overtime and burned out and, and everything else, we're going to keep everything going that you've always been doing. And now we're going to add on this whole COVID layer. That's, that's just not possible. And so, you know, we've looked at, are there things that we could stop for the next six months and making sure that those things that we're stopping are frankly less important and are there things that are more important that we have to keep going. Um, and so I think engaging people in those conversations, because I don't pretend that I know all the answers to that. So, but we can ask people what they think needs to keep going and what things need, maybe we can, we can scale back. I think telling people that you acknowledge that they're, they're frazzled and that you're intentionally making space for them. I think that's kind of a safety initiative in my mind because you're you're giving them the, a bit of a breather and a bit of an ability to focus on other things. But it's it's certainly not easy. I'm not going to recommend that you launch a new hand hygiene program in the middle of this, or that you you know pull out all the stops on MedRec at this particular moment when you're getting all of these admissions. It's, it's impossible, and so we just have to be mindful of that. Yeah, thanks for those reflections, Michael. And Danielle, I'm sure that's a challenge you guys are facing in Saskatchewan too, of how do you do you balance all these various things? Anything that you wanted to jump in on on that front? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, a big initiative that happened, and I know it's like, do we want to add more initiatives <laughs> into this at this time? But I think this one was so crucial to um, the response that we had in our health authority. And I can't believe we didn't do it before but that's cascading daily huddles. So, um, you know, previous we promoted huddles with our frontline team and the managers, but past that, it didn't really go anywhere. So the manager would maybe, you know, flag it for the director, but there wasn't that constant daily connection point. And I think that's been such a huge, I would never go away from it. Okay, if you, if you don't have daily cascade huddles with your team, it's time to start. Um, it is the connection point with my team every single morning where I'm meeting with my manager team and they've already met with their care team on the floor to say, what's going on today? Are we safe today? What do we need? How are we changing what we're doing in this moment? It's not a week later at a meeting that we're, um, you know, discussing something it's in the moment, which I then have a call 30 minutes after that with my executive director team to say, here's our flags today. Here's the help that we need. So um, I think that's that's been a huge addition to our team, a huge addition to keeping our fingers on the pulse of what's going on, being able to support our teams and pivot different resources kind of same day to support teams. So um, I think that's been a huge, huge benefit. And that's been across the whole province that we've, I think it's across the whole province, for sure, Integrated Rural Health, which is the south of the province. Um, we do those daily cascading calls with our team and that that was a directive that was put in. Um, and now that we're doing it, I, I wouldn't go without it. So um, huge, huge opportunity to promote psychological safety within your teams. Thanks for sharing that practice, Danielle. And, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, how we've sometimes adopted things and then it's like, oh, here's what really this adds value for us and, and gives us. Alice, it looks like you were wanting to jump in on that as well, or was I misreading your body language? It's always difficult on Zoom. You know, I, I would love to jump in actually. Um, yeah, I love Danielle's ideas of, of the cascade and we use that as well. Um, one of the powerful strategies I've seen over the years, and this is something that we really need to do, uh, continue to do more of is the engagement of patients in their care um, and just, and really allowing them to be that extra set of eyes and ears to detect errors before it reaches them. We need to involve them in the conversation, you know, nothing about me without me, encourage them to speak up if they see something that doesn't look right. And, you know, Wendy, sharing these uh, stories, what you just shared, um, when we launched uh, ISMP Canada launched MedAir.ca, we saw such a tremendous response of people reporting errors that they've experienced. 
things that we didn't know about. And these shared experiences and stories could help us understand better how to protect healthcare workers from making errors. When patients tell me their story, they say, we just wanna share our story so that it doesn't happen to anyone else. And they want to know what we're gonna to do to help prevent this from happening again. And I just wanted to share that perspective and that's such an important piece to partner with our patients. Thanks so much, Alice. And absolutely, Wendy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And maybe I can ask you to bring in not just that comment, but one that's a conversation that's happening in the chat as well around like, how do you know if it's safe to do that or if there's a fear culture in an organization? So Wendy, over to you. Yeah, just briefly, I just wanted to add to that other discussion that um, and when there's a discussion about huddles, I think bringing the patient and family into when it's specific to that case if there's any time it's essential, it's even more important now. So the involvement of the patient and or their advocate who, or whoever with the team is, is extremely, extremely important. So as opposed to, you know, do we have time to bring the patient into this and the family? I think it behooves everyone because in some ways they're part of the safeguard um, mm -hmm. to, the, to the safety of the care. And um, so their involvement becomes even more important even more important. So Jen, sorry, the other question? No, all good, it, not unrelated okay. actually. Um, when, how is it, how do we know if it's safe? How do we know if people feel safe to be able to participate in those kind of conversations? How do we know if there's a culture of fear? So, you know, it's great to have things like cascading huddles. We need to make sure that people feel okay to bring up issues and, and problems there. Have you, have you seen ways to, to be able to tell, you know, does, does it feel safe? Is it safe? How can I promote safety of people being able to participate in that kind of way? Okay, I'll just start briefly and then turn it over to the others. But I mean, I think it's part of the culture. It's not by the way you're feeling safe. Um, people intuitively will have a feel if when they say something, it's welcomed, people are receptive to it, suggestions are there. And as Michael said, the, that the support for the team is there. Um, that's all part of that culture you're setting. So it, it's not just a checkbox, do we have this in place or that? Um, it really is a tone and a tone that permeates whatever is going on uh, in the unit, in the organization. Um, so it, it's you need to set that tone and uh, make sure it's consistent through. If you have one manager who acts a certain way and is a bit abrupt or ignores things and you have another manager that doesn't, that's actually gonna slowly undermine um, the direction. So how you bring along your entire team to be setting that culture. And I think the patients and families will feel it too. They will see that. Um, they will know, should I feel comfortable in this environment or not? And I think they'll sense pretty quickly the, uh, the atmosphere. Thanks for sharing that, Wendy. And I think you're absolutely right that patients and families will also know. I know, you know, a relative of mine recently shared with me that he rations the issues that he brings up um, because there's only so much comfort to be able to do that. Anyone else want to weigh in on the question of how do we know if there's a culture of fear or if there's psychological safety? Michael. Yeah, I would say, to be honest with you, in organizations that I've worked with or worked for, um, it's usually fairly obvious if you are open to, to seeing it. Do you know what I mean? I, I think it's, it, I don't think that these things are necessarily hidden. I think they're kind of hidden in plain sight. And if, if you have your sort of safety feelers on, you can, you can figure that out pretty, pretty quickly. I mean, uh, you know, since coming to the island here, I've been involved in a number of, uh, of, of, of safety debriefs and you can read the body language and you can get a You can sort of read behind, you know, read between the lines about how this came about and what happened. And and and, you know, when I make comments like, you know, I'm not here to judge anybody. We work in a complex adaptive system and there's many reasons why things happen. I'm just here to understand and how do we make it better? when you see the look of shock on people's faces that you mean you're not going to come in and blame people. That's when you get a good, a good idea that that's, that's what's been going on before. I think, um, I think to be very honest with you, I, I think 
leaders struggle with the cultural piece because it feels so nebulous. And that's often when they go out and hire consultants to come in and tell them how to fix their culture and really it, that they're just wasting their money. They need to own that themselves. And there's nothing magical about it. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not easy. And it's, it's so much easier to bring in the consultant or bring in a series of checklists without dealing with the culture and then getting frustrated why the checklists aren't working, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think there is no way around this except through it. I think you actually have to address the culture. Um, and it's, uh, it's there and it's obvious, in my opinion. Thanks, Michael. And absolutely reflecting that culture is built at the speed of trust as well. Danielle, <laughs> excuse me, over to you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to build on that. I do think it's it's almost that gut feeling as a leader when you go out to your teams and knowing the conversations that are happening. Are there robust conversations happening when you go on the floor <laughs> and talk to people? Or can you tell that people are kind of holding back, right? I think that tells you right there what people feel that they are safe to tell you. And then I think it's also the conversation of, and I've used this line lots, but if there's an error that happened, it's likely because of a process problem. So what's our process that we need to, you know, adjust? It's not because one individual didn't know what to do because, you know, they're not good at their job. That's <laughs> very, very rarely what it is. It's usually what in the system is not allowing us to do a good job. And this just happened to be the time that we caught it. Right. So where is that gap and how do we get down to that root of where the problem is? So I think um, the robust conversations happening, I think a reporting culture. So I think I would be worried if I wasn't getting any reports. If there, if everyone's like, you know what, there's been no safety concerns submitted for two weeks, I would go, I don't believe you because we are human. So there's always things that we can be improving. So when I have a team that's continually saying, hey, here's a flag, here's a flag, then I know that their team is also speaking up because they feel it's a safe environment to speak up. So I think that can speak volumes to um, what kind of a culture that you have. Yeah, thanks for that reflection, Danielle. And I think it fits nicely with a comment from Marlise in the chat as well. If everyone nods and smiles and pretend it, pretends everything is fine, you've got your first clue, right? Which is similar to your, if there's no reports coming in, we know that things are happening. And so, you know, what are, what are we missing here? And I think Michael also to your reflection of like, there, there's a sense, right? You get that sense about whether people are holding things back or are comfortable. Michael. Yeah, to just go along with uh, Marlisa's statement, I think that, um, you know, you get a good sense of what kind of culture you're dealing with if, if you go into meetings with people and they are openly telling you what's wrong and what's not working, and they may even be angry about it because they're, they're frustrated. I mean, to me, there's a lot of hope in that. Um, the, the circumstance where you just get silence is is terrifying because uh, it just implies there's a lot of stuff being swept under the rug here. We're not going to really figure it out. So, you know, that's another key message in our in our strap plan is to kind of surface that 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 conflict in a way that surface that disagreement and get it out there and let's start actually having honest conversations about it. Um, and um, that to me means you're on the road to somewhere better um, and it shouldn't be misinterpreted as these people are just difficult. Um, you want people to have an opinion. Absolutely. And to me, an opinion implies hope that things can change and, you know, a, a desire to see that change as well and a, a commitment to do that together. So um, there was also a comment in the chat, sorry, I've just got to scroll up in terms of um, from Nancy, the challenges in having family involvement in the current climate and with restrictions that are going on now. And I think I've absolutely seen that across the country. And for those who are interested in working on that particular challenge, I'll come to you, Wendy, in just a sec. Um, there's a whole series of resources uh, available as well. Maybe one of my colleagues can pop them into the chat in terms of the safe reentry of essential care partners and engagement. Wendy, over to you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important because I, I respect that comment about difficulty in having family members there. 
but there's the telephone on speaker. And when there's a particular appointment and you can't have a relative with you, then at minimum have them connected um, to the phone on speaker so they can hear the dialogue and help translate. Um, because you need that other pair of ears as well, because the patient in their vulnerable time only hears so much. So really saying, we don't want to be speaking to this patient alone. Um, it's, it's critical to have whoever is uh, you know, important in their life present for the discussion, present on the speakerphone, present on video or whatever. But I think it behooves all of us to make sure that hasn't dropped off. And uh, I'm an essential caregiver for my for my elderly mother and um, you know, how you keep, keep in touch one way or another and or when you can visit, but uh, we've got to find strategies around this uh, in order to try and engage, engage patient and family together. Alice, were you wanting to jump in on that? Yeah, I was gonna go back to the, how do you know it's a safe culture? If, if uh, an employee speaks up and gives it, uh, you know, shares a concern, I think in a good culture, the person would get a response back from the people who are leading that say, oh, thank you for your uh, concern and this is what we're gonna do about it or this is what we decided. At least that there, there's some feedback loop saying that we received you know, your concern or even your report, your I report that doesn't just get filed, but something's actually being done about what you're saying that really encourages employees to speak up more maybe closes the loop back. Sorry, I didn't mean to use that analogy, like also closes the loop, but also feeds back to what Wendy said uh, earlier in our conversation, just in terms of that um, sort of holistic engagement that not just at one time, but throughout as well. So our hour has flown by together. I can't believe that we are nearing the very end. Um, we have an opportunity maybe for a couple of final quick reflections. If anyone on the panel, there's something that you've been dying to say that you haven't had a chance to, now's your opportunity to wave at me to make sure they get in. And now's your opportunity, if you're part of this process, to add things into the chat as well. Alice and then Wendy. Sure. Um, design and implement system level solutions that make it impossible to do the wrong thing. Reminders don't work. Support staff after errors through to recovery, not early retirement. Safety is a journey of sharing, learning, and then doing the next right thing. Wow, you packed a lot in there. Thank you, thank you Alice. Wendy? Oh, good for her. Um, I was going to say there's been the immense focus on staff safety and HHR issues. There's not enough talk about patient safety and risk. And what is our message to patients? How do we advise our patients about the reality? What are some tips we should be giving them? What's that message? Um, there just isn't the messaging there. And my last comment is we're at major risk right now of lowering the standards of care and accepting lower standards of care as the standard. And I think it's a, it's a critical, uh, we all need to be focused on that and saying, you know, some of what we're dealing with now, we appreciate we need to get through this to get through it, but it behooves all of us to make sure that we don't accept, we don't lower the bar and accept a lower bar on quality of care and safety. Thank you. Seeing lots of nods as you're talking, Wendy. Danielle. Um, yeah, I just think a big takeaway today that I would share for you is how important listening is to those that you support and care for. So um, whether that's through a cascade, whether that's through a care conference, as we've talked about and Wendy's talked about lots and having the family and patient included in their care. So um, if there's an opportunity for you to listen to the people that you either support or provide care to, I think that's um, jump on it because that's where you're gonna gonna hear how things are going, know your culture, and uh, know where you can do those improvements. Thank you so much, Danielle. Michael, did you have one last takeaway, and then we'll close out for today? Yeah, I think my advice would be when you're looking to uh, address a particular concern, invite people who don't agree with you. Invite all those diverse opinions in the room, and especially hear from frontline staff on what needs to be done. That's the way forward. Uh, the way we normally do it of top down from the CEO down to other people gets you nowhere. 
Thanks so much, Michael. A good note to end on and a good reminder on that last whip round from everyone. Thank you so much to all of our panelists today. Huge thank you to all who joined in as part of participating in the webinar, adding resources in chats, uh, sharing ideas, and uh, also thank you to the great team who made today's webinar possible behind the scenes and uh, appreciate everything that you do. Thank you all so much. Stay safe, everyone. And it's January in Canada. Stay warm if you can. Thank you very much.